In May 1989, John William Cooper went on Bullseye, a prime-time ITV programme watched by 17 million. Nice to see you. You're from Milford Haven down there. It's a lovely part of the world. You've got an unusual hobby, John, haven't you? He had murdered two people. Oh, yes, the scuba diving. The scuba uh, diving. And it, apparently, it's, it's the place to do it down there, isn't it? Oh, we've got the coastline. Within three weeks of this filming, he'd murder two more on that same coastline. What was the motive? What could have happened? It must have been horrific. A, a complete madman would, would have, could only have carried it out. His appalling crimes cast a long, dark shadow over a peaceful rural community as he continued to live amongst them. I think he came to a point where he actually believed that he was un untouchable. This is an account of a murder investigation spanning 25 years. A vicious, cunning character who was very difficult to catch. The cutting-edge forensic evidence that finally convicted a serial killer. When you find the first bit of evidence, it's like turning on a light switch, and suddenly it's all illuminated. And the victims he left behind. How can you live with yourselves? Is what you've done to my parents. All this has dominated so much of my life. I mean, I just want rid of this person. I just want my life back. This is the peaceful rural Pembrokeshire coast, West Wales. This is an area of outstanding natural beauty. It is, is one of the safest places in the UK to live. The aptly named Little Haven is a popular holiday destination and the perfect base to explore the coastline. But in 1989, it became the scene of a horrific crime. That June, Peter and Gwenda Dixon, a couple in their 50s, travelled here from Oxford. He was a gentleman, Peter. He was a man who uh, people would readily turn to, be they in trouble. He was a good role model uh, when we were growing up. Um, both him and Gwenda were the kind of people you would want as friends, as neighbours. They liked the Pembrokeshire coastline. They liked the people. Um, I think they went virtually every year there for as many years as I can remember. See if we could see that little tower. Yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's when it's my Yeah. Their campsite bordered the scenic coastal path. Yeah. Were you there? Yeah. And on the last day of their holiday, they went for a walk. The sun was shining and the weather was improving and they spoke to a couple near to the, to the tent to actually say to them we are going for a last walk um, to let the tent dry. Unbeknown to them, it was the last time that they would walk the coastal path. Around half a mile from the campsite, they entered a wooded area. You two, get down on the ground now! No. Get on the floor now! <laughs> now! I want your money! Hurry up! Two days later, their son Tim reported them missing and police began to comb the area. I was overlooking the coastal path now and the bay in front of me, puzzling now, thinking what on earth might have happened. And I hadn't been there five minutes when all of a sudden my two dog handlers shouted, Don, boss, come quickly. 
I ran up the coastal path, some 300 yards, and there, down in a ravine on the right-hand side, was the most horrific scene that I've ever come across. The two bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Dixon, female lying here, male uh, six foot away, tied up, shotgun wounds, terrible, terrible sight. I must admit, I was really shocked to the roots. Peter was tied up and they'd been robbed and shot in the face at point blank range with a sawn off shotgun. I think as an investigator, what becomes quite clear is the amount of violence that the victims have had to suffer. And one of them must have been shot before the other, knowing that their fate was going to be the same. I, I can't believe what state of mind they must have been in just before the moment that they were actually murdered. Pembrokeshire's largest ever murder inquiry was launched, sending shockwaves through the quiet rural community. Holidaymakers have been warned to be on their guard while the hunt for the killer of Mr. and Mrs. Dixon continues. One of those chance encounters that has an impact on you for the rest of your life. If they hadn't rained the night before, if they'd have gone north instead of south, but uh, there's lots of ifs and buts in life, and uh, uh, the consequences of this if and but um, has lived with us for the last 22 years. Please, if anyone has any information that might help, tell the police. And to the persons responsible, you can't be happy with yourselves. But why don't you just give yourselves up to the police? How can you live with yourselves with what you've done to my parents? The killer had terrified Peter Dixon into giving him his PIN number, and he'd used it to withdraw £300 from cash points in the area. What was the motive? for small amounts of money gained from stealing the credit cards, three or four hundred pound. It didn't make sense at all. And to be killed in cold blood. He used he, sufficient violence to have killed them several times over. There was n this wasn't just a robbery for gain. It was uh, an act of a psychopath. Witnesses provided a description of a suspect seen using the cash machine in Pembroke. What we are appealing to the public for in relation to this individual is anyone who has seen him in the West Wales area during the past three weeks. Police interviewed 6,000 people but were no closer to catching the killer. One person questioned was a local farm labourer, John William Cooper. Peter Dixon's wedding ring was uh, was missing from his uh, his body, and it was discovered that John William Cooper had actually sold a a ring. And he provided uh, an explanation that it was his wedding ring, that was supported by his family. So at that stage, there was nothing else to suggest that he was actually uh, a suspect or a person of interest. What police didn't know is that Cooper had a history of violence. No one knows that better than his son, Andrew. When I was nine, um, was the first time that my father got violent with me. Uh, I'd refused to wear a pair of shorts. He wouldn't treat me like a child. He would come at me frothing at the mouth. His eyes would be bulging. He'd expand himself, he'd clench his fists, and he would lay into me like, like I was made of rubber. He, he purposely bounced me off door frames and just throw me around like I was a doll. But to everyone else, when he was in the pub or out playing darts or social life, they were patting him on the back, good old Johnny. No one suspected John Cooper of the murders, and after 18 months, the inquiry was scaled down. to think that two people who came to an area that they loved to effectively to be tied up and executed 
It really went beyond belief for those involved and the shockwaves you know, carried on for many, many years. One double murder in this countryside community was shocking. But four years earlier, less than 10 miles away from Little Haven, there'd been another. In December 1985, police were called to a house fire in Scoverston Park. Well, what you had was a, a raging fire, howling winds, heavy rain, the worst scenario you could find. Inside were the badly burnt bodies of Richard Thomas and his sister Helen. Richard had been shot in the head and stomach. Helen had been tied up and shot in the head. Obviously, there had been a deliberate attempt to set the place on fire, to try and prevent any trace of who had carried out this horrible incident. The motive seemed clear, a robbery gone wrong. Police believed the robber had targeted the house knowing Helen Thomas was home alone, but had been disturbed by Richard arriving and panicked. The possibility was that the persons had been killed would have known who the perpetrator was. Why kill the two people? Officers carried out standard house-to-house -house inquiries. Living less than a mile away from Scoverston Park, John William Cooper. The whole of the family gave each other an alibi in the fact that they were in the house together at the time. So, so therefore, that alibi looked quite, um, quite strong and, and, and cast iron at the time. He said the, the police were coming around asking questions about this murder and oh, if you happen to see him, he said it so casually, if you happen to see him, just say we were all doing this. You don't, you know what they're like. They're just going to annoy us otherwise. And he walked away and I thought nothing of it. All the clues were there, but I wasn't mature enough to put them together at the time. I mean, I was used to him saying something and me saying yes anyway. He didn't say no to him. John Cooper had evaded capture twice. In 1996, he would strike again. No. Get on the floor now! Hurry up! To think that one individual was confident in controlling five people and then subjecting them to an absolutely horrific attack, it speaks volumes for that individual. By the 90s, the Welsh county of Pembrokeshire had four horrific unsolved murders. In 1985, Helen and Richard Thomas were shot dead in their home and their house set on fire. In 1989, Peter and Gwenda Dixon were executed, also by shotgun, on a bright summer's day on the coastal path near Little Haven. Any murder is violent, but these were particularly horrendous crimes. I think it shocked the community, and I think it shocked the police officers investigating because it was so out of their experiences in, in dealing with crime within that area. In March 1996, another violent crime left its mark on this quiet rural community. Five local teenagers walking through fields in Milford Haven were subjected to a terrifying attack. Just as it was starting to go dark, they were aware of a, a man or a figure walking towards them with a torch. He was wearing a balaclava, dark clothing and holding a shotgun. Get down on the floor now, this I'll shoot you! No messing! He terrorised these teenagers. He then went on to rape and sexually assault two females and later demand money from the rest of the group. He fired the shotgun in the air as a warning shot. So it must have been an absolutely terrifying experience for all of them. They were children going down to the woods that night and, you know, once the incident had occurred, they had to grow up very quickly. Um, they lost their innocence, uh, their confidence, uh, their trust in other people. That must be a dreadful thing to try to come to terms with. 
No one was caught, leaving Pembrokeshire police with three unsolved violent crimes in 10 years. At the same time, the local area was plagued by burglaries and armed robberies. These robberies tend to, to fit into the same pattern. Single females in houses attacked during the evening by a single offender, and the offender was carrying a sawn-off shotgun and had a balaclava. In November 1996, the intruder was disturbed during one such robbery. Fleeing the scene, he discarded items in a hedge. Police making inquiries at a nearby house found stolen goods. The house belonged to John William Cooper. We looked at in a region of 70 burglaries that we believed he had uh, he'd committed. Not only his house, but his family's houses were searched and uh, a great deal of property were recovered from those houses. The evidence found connected him to 29 burglaries and an armed robbery, where he used a sawn-off shotgun and wore a balaclava. That was the first time that John Cooper came on the radar for being a suspect of the murders at Scoverson Park and the Coastal Path. Cooper was questioned about the four killings. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a murderer. I am not a murderer. John Cooper would never admit his guilt. So it was felt that to connect him to the double murders, there would need to be a what we call the golden nugget of forensic evidence. At that time, forensic analysis drew a blank. They're using me to clear old crimes. It shouldn't be allowed. It shouldn't be allowed. Cooper was sentenced to 14 years for burglary and robbery. For eight years, all the evidence collected for the case was carefully stored by David Powis Police. In 2006, it was finally time to launch a cold case review of the three crimes. We were always confident that uh, John William Cooper was the prime suspect. Having said that, we were not tailoring our investigation towards an individual. It was a search for the truth. Advances in forensic science might now lead them to the golden nugget of evidence they needed. But it was a daunting task. We're probably talking in the end around about a million and a half to two million pieces of paper, which we have to physically go through. We are talking of, of thousands of exhibits. The team had to make vital decisions about what might give them that crucial forensic link. We knew that we couldn't just say, right, there's 5,000 exhibits. Here you are forensically, look at those 5,000 exhibits because A, it's not practical, and B, you just couldn't afford to do uh, an investigation. Week after week, then month after month, they selected items to send to the forensic lab. And scientists scoured them for potential DNA evidence. In the meantime, an interview team was put together. Over the following few months, they would learn more about John Cooper than he knew himself. Within a social environment, he could come across as a very pleasant individual. A number of people that actually played darts with him said that he was very well mannered. Can you name one of them? Hampshire. It's right, sir, for 140 pounds. You could go into any high secure prison this afternoon and you would meet many, many charming men. Now the surprise, behind that warm social persona, there is sometimes, you know, a man who has a less warm, colder, callous persona. Behind closed doors, Cooper took his aggression out on his son, Andrew. Emotionally, the worst time I've been fishing down uh, the, 
at the pond. I came across the field and he was walking out, going um, shooting. As I got to him, he hit me with his open hand to the floor, put his foot on my chest. He put the barrel of the single gun, single barrel in my mouth. He told me how worthless I was. He told me that the family didn't want me anymore and he was going to end my life. And then he went quiet and I just stared at his finger. And he was slowly, it was like he knew I was watching his finger and he was slowly squeezing this trigger. And when his finger got halfway down, I just felt really calm. And I just closed my eyes. My body went completely calm. And I felt the click. And he pulled the trigger. There was no cartridge in the gun, but I didn't know that. And that's the day my childhood ended. From that day on, it's, I was 11 years old. John Cooper was a gambler. Building up a picture of his background, police found out he'd won £90,000 on Spot the Ball in 1979. We didn't benefit from that money. It was all him, it was his drinking money, his gambling money. But with the drinking came more beatings. When I was 12, I don't even remember what I'd done. He got hold of me on the landing, he'd shove me in my bedroom, he'd bounce me off the walls as usual, he'd throw me on my bed. And he started punching me, he, I mean, he used to strangle me. And he held me by my neck and punched me so hard in my back that I let out a scream, but it was as if someone else was letting it out. I've now got 12 screws holding my spine together. Cooper's prize money should have set the family up for life, but over the following years, he lost it all. He entered into a number of business ventures um, which were, were built on sand. They were doomed to fail. As he lost money then, obviously the lifestyle that he had then adopted began to suffer. That began to make sense in terms of better understanding burglaries, obviously, because he's after money, but also about risk-taking and excitement to compensate for whatever else was missing in his life. One of the things that I think is particularly uh, saddening about the murder of the Dixons is they were a couple happily walking on a coastal path on a bright summer's day. And I think perhaps this man had a very strong sense of envy that people could live a life like that apparently happily when he so blatantly could not. John Cooper craved respect. So the interview team were briefed to listen and let him feel in control. I thought that if we got him to talk, then he may provide us with some ammunition to come back and challenge him, him later on. In July 2008, while waiting for a forensic breakthrough, the team spent four days interviewing John Cooper. He was still serving time for burglary, but a release date was imminent. The first three days, we just allowed him to talk. Tell me about times that you actually know it. I've seen the pictures of the place and I've seen it in the papers and what have you. Uh, I've already answered the question. Outside then, then, but about 12 days. So, have you ever been to those areas? He wasn't challenged, we just invited him to tell us about Cooper. One of the drill bits caught in, um, in the wedding ring 
and uh, it was well worn from working on the buildings and I nearly went over the side so most of the time my wedding ring wasn't worn by me right. much, much to my wife's uh, right. uh, displeasure. The team hoped that by letting Cooper talk he would give something away. During yesterday's interview, John, yes, you mentioned that during the trial, you handled a shotgun. Oh, a shotgun was in the court, yes, I believe it was, yes. Uh, the shotgun used in the robbery that I was convicted of. In yeah, 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 yeah. They noticed Cooper kept referring to a particular shotgun the police had already identified as a potential murder weapon. Whether I handled it or not, I can't, I can't remember. He actually wrote down on a piece of paper, uh, the, the Judge Morton Sardis gun, destruction order. Quite clearly that gun was causing him problems, though he'd already served the sentence for it, so we couldn't really see why he was worried about that particular gun. Cooper believed the judge in his robbery trial had ordered the gun to be destroyed and seemed worried that it had been kept. It had already been forensically examined, but police asked scientists to inspect it again. John Cooper was returned to his cell to see out the last few months of his prison term. I think he came out to the interviews as if he had won the battle. He was confident that at um, the conclusion of the inquiries that he wouldn't be charged. In January 2009, John William Cooper was released from prison. I'd had a conversation with Adrian West and some of the things that he said to me really caused me concern in that, you know, Steve, the person who's done this has enjoyed what they've done. He will uh, be released into the community. He will have ideas about what he's going to do. They will fail. He will enter a spiral of offending and he will uh, kill it. In January 2009, John William Cooper was released from prison after serving 10 years for burglary and armed robbery. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a murderer. I am not a murderer. David Powers police believed he'd committed four shotgun murders, a rape and a sexual assault, but had never been able to find proof. In 2006, they had launched a cold case review, determined to find a forensic link in items taken from Cooper's house. We were always told by our barrister that if we had that one piece of golden forensic evidence, then we'd make our case into a very, very strong, compelling case. Two years into the inquiry, after failing to find DNA evidence, the team changed tack and started to look at clothing fibres. It is amazing, there's a huge variety of different textile fibres and I think people don't quite realise the enormous variety there is and therefore why it's such a good evidence type. Analysts looked at tapings from various exhibits under a microscope to identify any matching fibres. One of the items police chose for examination was a pair of John Cooper's shorts. Those shorts very much fitted the profile of uh, a, a photo fit of an offender who was seen using the cash card belonging to Peter Dixon. They were three years into the inquiry and the team had built up a strong circumstantial case against Cooper. But they still needed a forensic link and were frustrated that nothing had been found. We'd gone for three years of, of meticulously looking at every item, every day, wake up and say, right, this is the day that we're going to get the results that we're looking for. Finally, in April 2009, there was a breakthrough. Forensic experts had been examining tapings from the shorts. They were looking for fibre matches, but they discovered a spot of blood. You can take a tiny, tiny amount of it and test it chemically, and if you get a positive for that, it's very, very likely to be blood, and that's enough for you to be able to cut a bit of tape out and stick it in for DNA profiling. The 20-year-old spot of blood on John Cooper's shorts 
was Peter Dixon's. We got a full profile, so it would be uh, less than one in a billion people you would get as a chance match. So it was incredibly strong evidence. I don't mind saying it, but it was quite an emotional moment. That golden nugget, that weird crave for so long, had suddenly been presented to us. We now had a link to a double murder. I was confident that, that was just going to be the start of, of many more. Sure enough, more evidence was found on the shotgun the team had identified as a potential murder weapon. It was found in a hedge and it was linked to John Cooper by a screw from his shed. Basically a screw from a little pot in his, in his green shed was the screw that came out of, of, a, of a hole in that gun. The team observed the barrels had been painted black. Underneath that paint, blood DNA had been preserved. They found the blood of Peter Dixon on the breech end of the gun and on the barrel of the gun. At that stage, we knew that we'd found the murder weapon. By John Cooper painting the barrels, he's actually gone and preserved the evidence for us. David Powers Police now had evidence that John Cooper had executed Peter and Gwenda Dixon on the coastal path near Little Haven. Even though I knew the sort of person he was, I just didn't want any of that to be true. I didn't. I mean, to kill someone for just a few hundred pound. To kill someone anyway, but... I mean, they were executed for a few hundred pound. I'm still trying to get my head around that, that one. I really am. To strengthen their case, police wanted to connect Cooper to a description of a man seen using Peter Dixon's cash card. In the Hunting Inquiry, it been identified that it appeared on, on Bullseye. John and Harvey with £220, please. <laughs> In securing that uh, material, it was identified by ITV themselves that there was a profile which effectively was like a tracing of that artist's impression. John Cooper took part in the filming of that programme just over three weeks before Peter and Gwenda Dixon were murdered. For me, that was a, a, a crucial piece of evidence. What are you going to do? You'd like to gamble. There it is. I'll take this one here. But why would a violent criminal risk appearing on national television? John Cooper felt that he was untouchable. That would have not raised an issue with him, the fact that he would go on to national television and people would see him, I think, actually probably enjoyed that attention. 20. It attracted within the local community. A one, 26. He would have seen it as a challenge to go on. Even so, he still gambles. That's what it means, compulsive. They just can't give it up, can they? As he had done throughout his life, Cooper gambled and lost. Oh, unlucky. Just three weeks later, he murdered Peter and Gwenda Dixon. But we're just moving into position now. In May 2009, David Paris police arrested John Cooper for murder. This footage was filmed by the police. He's kicked off. Huh? He's kicked off. They're in around the corner. He's kicked off. Cooper had only been out of prison for six months, but police were relieved to have him back in custody. On his arrest, we found in his car there was a rope, there was gloves, and we're also aware that he had got an ordnance survey map of parts of Pembrokeshire. I think it was only a matter of time before he would have started to commit burglaries, go on to robberies, and I've got no doubt that had the circumstances uh, prevailed, he would have murdered him. He was taken to Haverford West Police Station to be interviewed. The purpose was to connect Cooper to the exhibit that had been forensically linked to the murders. During the interview, what we did, we showed him the artist's impression. 
of the suspect who used the Dixon's cash card. And we also showed him his shorts. Would you accept that those shorts resemble the shorts in the Arctic profession? <laughs> Not a bit, no. Okay. But those shorts, have you no. ever seen... Sorry, have you ever seen the shorts in this photograph, TWB1, before? I believe those are my bathers, actually. Okay. Because he thought that we were looking for the similarities in those shorts to the artist's impression, he happily admitted that the shorts were his shorts, and, you know, and that for us was key. Then, without realising, Cooper incriminated himself further. Those are long-legged shorts. Okay, you're pointing the difference then, you say that they're not similar and that they're longer on the artist's impression. Well, those are short-legged shorts, that's long-legged shorts. Police asked forensic scientists to examine the shorts again. They had been shortened, possibly by Cooper's wife. They unstitched the hem, and inside the hem, they found a DNA profile which matched Julie Dixon, who was the daughter of Grendon Peter Dixon. We believed then is that those shorts probably were taken from Peter Dixon's rucksack. Because there would have been no other reason as to how Julie's DNA came onto those shorts under the hem. Cooper had kept the shorts for 10 years. I think it, it gives us an insight into John Cooper as an individual. I think that's part and parcel of Cooper, was that control element that he had things, memento, to remind him of his offending. Soon, forensic scientists began to uncover fibre matches. You very, very rarely find any fibres that match. And where you do, it's really only one or two fibres. So if you find them in number, it means something. If you find them in combination, it means something. And if you find two-way transfer, it all means something. When Cooper was arrested in 1998 for burglary, police took sweepings from his shed. Fibres were found in those sweepings from gloves and a balaclava left in a hedge near Cooper's house. Scientists looked for matching fibres on exhibits from the four murders and a violent sexual attack on teenagers in Milford Haven. As time started to, to unfold, virtually on a daily basis, we were having phone calls. Fibres from gloves that he abandoned were found in the clothing and underwear of the rape victim from the Milford Haven attack. Fibres from the, one of those gloves was found in the sewn hem of the shorts that were recovered from his house. Fibres found in the pockets of those shorts were linked to fibres found on the, the, the socks of Richard Thomas from the Scoverson murders. Cooper's habit of storing and reusing his offending toolkit meant fibres from each crime could be traced back to him. Faced with the forensic evidence, Cooper still refused to admit his guilt, even pointing the finger at his own son. Have you any explanation to give as to how that blood could have innocently appeared on the shorts? I really do not know. As I said, my wife sourced the shorts. Maybe from Percy, maybe from a shop. I don't know, whatever she sourced. Okay. Uh, more worryingly is, my son used to take my clothes whenever he wanted it, and that would be more of a worry for a father. I can't believe it. I was gobsmacked. I think that of all the things he's done to me, I think that was the lowest thing I ever saw him do. That was a hard, hard thing to hear your own father say about you. I believe that you're responsible for the murder of Helen and Richard Thomas, and also the murders of Gwenda and Peter Dixon. All I can say is I'm sorry if you've got that opinion, but you're totally wrong. When I've pushed him a bit on um, how he always blamed everybody else for everything that's ever gone wrong in his life, it's sort of flicked a bit of a switch within him, I think, and that's the time he, we've seen the sort of different side to him. You're making things try to fit to John Cooper, and it's bloody annoying. We got this friends again, it all comes back. You know, I just, young lady, you, I once said, you're trying to make things fit 
I've tried to put you and give you information that you can check. You choose, you, you and your colleagues and them in there choose not to believe it. The time now is 17.01 and no further questions and turn the tape recorder off. Cooper was held in custody until the trial, where his many victims hoped finally to see justice. I know the levels of violence he can use. And it horrifies me that he's used them on other people. All this has dominated so much of my life, but I'm still having to go through this. I mean, I just want rid of this person. I just want my life back. The long-awaited trial of John William Cooper began in March 2011. You must judge me after the trial, not before. Judge me after the trial. He was charged with the brutal murders of Helen and Richard Thomas in their home. Peter and Gwenda Dixon on the Pembrokeshire coastal path. And an attack on five teenagers in Milford Haven involving the rape of a 16-year-old girl and the indecent assault of another. Even faced with substantial evidence, he would never admit his involvement in anything. I'm disgusted that he, he won't give some closure to, to uh, people out there. I'm disgusted. The trouble with the bully is, beating you is only half of their pleasure. The other half of their pleasure is knowing that you're scared of them for the rest of your life. And I believe that's what he's doing to these victims by not telling them. Just get on the floor! David Powers police showed the jury the complex forensic evidence they'd spent years uncovering. Cooper had kept mementos of his offending that connected him to all of the crimes. When you look at those links, it's quite a compelling forensic link. John Cooper to all those offences. Fifteen years on, the two girls who were raped and sexually assaulted described their experience to the jury. To actually have to relive the smells and the noises and their experiences and what he actually did must be absolutely horrendous. And knowing they're doing that in a formal environment must be terrifying. After suffering years of physical and emotional abuse at the hands of his father, Andrew Cooper agreed to testify for the prosecution. I didn't have to go in the courtroom. I, I had a video link in the courtroom. I didn't want him seeing me. I just didn't think he had the right to even look at me after what he, at the embarrassment he's brought on my family and me. Some of his family supported John Cooper throughout the trial. On one hand, I got people having to go at me for helping the police to convict him. On the other hand then, I've got people having to go at me for being his son. So I'm in a lose-lose situation. I did what I thought was right. And I'll stand by that, and I'd have done it again. The trial lasted nine weeks. The jury took three days to come to a verdict. I remember looking at the jury and I um, thought, what they had to see <clears throat> and listen to would probably stay with them for the rest of their lives. The photographs, the consequences of what a 12 bore shotgun would do at close range, no human being should see that. To see some of the jury members crying, uh, holding hands. Uh, it was quite, quite something, which I'll probably never, ever experience again in my career. Cooper was found guilty on all charges. To quote the judge, the murders were of such evil wickedness that the mandatory sentence of life will mean just that. The impact was quite phenomenal. Um, None of us could speak, I don't think, for a few minutes. Cooper is where he belongs. We had a debt of gratitude towards Steve Wilkins and his team that I don't suppose we'll ever repay. And uh, the community has a debt of gratitude as well. I think for the public, it's a great thing he's behind bars. For me, even, 
it's where he belongs. It's, he's got to pay the price for what he's done. I just wish it had happened sooner. There was a dark shadow that was hanging over us. That person responsible for those offences was living amongst us. The fact that we were in a position to take Cooper to court, to secure that conviction and secure that conviction with overwhelming evidence, I think has lifted that dark cloud which has hung over us for many years.